<coughs> Hello, everybody. <coughs> I'm very happy to introduce Koku and Stukrat here uh, to lecture you all on uh, animisms. And uh, to not take too much of everybody's time, I will summarize. Koku is a professor of religious studies at Groningen University, Netherlands, and he's also the director of Graduate School of Religion, Culture and Society, and um, has been the president uh, of International Society for the Study of Religion, Nature and Culture, as well as the Dutch Association for the Study of Religion. And he's also one of the founding board members of the European Society for the Study of Western Esotericism. And uh, he's... Uh, He's done quite a lot of research, some of the books you've probably read. For example, the one that is available in Estonian language, uh, which I will show you all. I'm sure you've all read the introduction by him. Uh, one of you has even translated it. <laughs> so, and, uh, and he has also published books like Scientification of Religion, and more recently, A Cultural History of the Soul, Europe and North America from 1870 to the present. And uh, also, you can also, those of you who are fluent in Estonian language can read him in the November edition of the journal Academia, where you can find his, uh, one of his better known articles on discursive study of religion. This is also the copy from Academia that Koku gets as his personal copy, so here's one gift. Thank and you. in addition, we also to thank him for coming here and lecturing. We have a bigger gift for him, and this is when he has finished uh, lecturing to us about his research, he gets to go home and get a little sneak peek into all the research we have done here. So he gets this Estonian study of religion reader in addition. And um, I think that's it, and I will hand over the floor to you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, nice introduction and for the, for the reads i will i look forward to reading all that and particularly also thank you for inviting me here to um, have this conversation with you and uh, talk with you and present something my idea present my ideas and um, um, ask your opinion about um, a topic that is on the one hand maybe a little bit boring um, animism but um, i hope uh, that after these three um, meetings, we will have um, uh, um, an interesting um, approach to the whole uh, topic. But I also like to like to uh, thank the um, Soci uh, Association um, for the Study of Religion for this honor to be here and for inviting me. It is really an honor um, to um, have this conversation with so many um, important and interesting and engaged people uh, in this community. And I really look forward to um, um, presenting my ideas and also to asking your um, um, response to that. So I will not misuse the whole time for, for presenting. Um, this should not be a one-way uh, one um, street, but uh, I really uh, think this is a good occasion to also have a conversation about the topics that um, I'd like to address. And many of these topics uh, resonate with some um, recent research that I've uh, been doing, and uh, some of you uh, know that, like the Cop uh, Copenhagen Conference, where, where one or two of you uh, were, but also other topics that um, have resonated not only with my own work uh, recently, but also with uh, the study of religion, religion more generally, and in particularly also anthropology and the study of religion that is engaged with um, topics like ecology or nature-based spiritualities and uh, climate change and all these uh, um, issues and uh, questions that resonate with these with these topics. And what I'd like to uh, do is in the in the first um, round, if you want to talk a little bit uh, about the, how the whole study of animism came into, um, into being, uh, which is an identifiable context. And then in, tomorrow I will talk about um, the more recent, including also the uh, current 
um, reclaiming of animism among many practitioners, but also among um, some of the um, uh, scholars who study animism. And in the last, uh, on Thursday, I'd like to um, talk about what does that all mean for our study of religion um, today and how do we adapt, how do we make the study of religion fit for the 21st century. I mean, we've been already 23 years into the century, but that sounds nice to uh, update the study of religion to topics like uh, climate change and uh, non-anthropocentric approaches to religion and so on. We will have ample time to discuss this, but that's, um, that's my main, um, main idea about this. And yeah, this works. And to begin with, I mean, you could ask yourself why, why study animism, right? It is uh, not, not a term that has been fashionable in the study of religion and in anthropology for a long time. And it has re-emerged somehow on the scene um, over the last 15, 20 uh, years. Um, but it's today a, an element of something that is larger than just animism. And I have a photo here actually from Berlin two years ago. Um, and that was in a bar somewhere in the, in the toilet, uh, <laughs> in the restrooms of, the, of a bar. And that, that nails it quite, quite nicely. Uh, religion kills, spirituality saves. And that is part of what we see today, I'm sure also uh, in your own research, that many people call themselves spiritual but not religious. Um, it's a whole movement, it's a whole scene also. So there's sociological research uh, done on that. You can also identify what, what is it exactly, what, what these uh, people do. It's a certain phenomenon in Europe and North America, sometimes also called the nuns, right? But N-O-N-E, right? The nuns that they don't have a religion, but they still call themselves spiritual, some of them, if they are not uh, atheists. But there's, there's very strong sociological research and evidence about uh, the growing influence of, of this. According to the Pew Research Center, more than 60% of American millennials engage in New Age spirituality, what the Pew uh, Research Center, Pew Research Center calls um, uh, New Age spirituality. 60%, um, but this group is less likely than previous generations to believe in God or see religion as an important part of their life. And that, that's basically a number that you find all over the place in Western Europe um, and in the UK and in North America as well. And against, g given the fact that these um, popular spiritualities, whatever that is, that would need another unpacking, but animism is part of that, that's my, that's my argument. Um, and given the fact that these popular spiritualities have emerged in, uh, in, in, in societies that are deemed secular, it has been pointed out that um, simple theories of secularization, so the more secularization, the less religion. So that's, uh, that's the equation that was very prop, uh, popular in the 1950s and 1960s, not so much longer than that. Um, have, have to be replaced by some more nuanced interpretations of what actually happened to religion with the rise of what we call modernity or industrialization, capitalization, and uh, westernization. All these, these terms are um, somehow new candidates for um, explaining what's going on. But certainly a binary understanding of religion on the one hand versus science and a secularity on the other hand does not really uh, work. And scholars of religion also have pointed out that often these secular uh, mindsets, worldviews, models, cosmologies, however you want to uh, call them, may also be themselves religiously productive. They produce new spiritualities, kinship ethics, all kinds of nature-based spiritualities maybe that flow out of uh, scientific uh, research. As often that's what I call in that book, the scientification of religion. It's something, something that, that is uh, 
one element um, of that. Um, the, the result is a much more complex interpretation of cultural processes. Um, and that, that's an interpretation that also troubles many narratives about um, European modernity and rationality that are still strong identity markers today. And this is where animism comes into play, uh, at least in my interpretation. And uh, as I want to show the work on animism, <laughs> if you want to call it like that, reveals a deep structure of uh, European thinking and practice. And if we look at ideas in practice, and that's also in preparation, because uh, one of these articles was translated into, uh, into Estonian, um, I, discourse research has to do with ideas and practice. And you asked me to explain this or um, apply or show a little bit how I at least apply discourse research. And I will not bore you with uh, too much theory here, but I, I think I owe you a, at least a very short um, um, definition or explanation of what I'm actually doing. You can read more in that is one of the many books that, that are out, out there if you're interested in, in that uh, topic. But the important thing is that discourses are not only ideas. Yeah? And the uh, historical discourse analysis is not the same as history of ideas. Because discourses are ideas in practice. Right? They, they are practices. And uh, here you have a, a nice uh, definition not by myself, but by Eder. Um, he says that discourses are practices that systematically organize and regulate statements about a certain theme. By doing so, discourses determine the conditions of possibility of what in a social group at a certain, certain period of time can be thought and said. If you know a little bit about Michel Foucault, you, feel, you see this here already. This is about how orders of knowledge are constructed and come into existence. Not only constructed, but how they emerge and how they legitimize themselves all, um, all, over, the, uh, all over the place, basically, by practices, by laws, by certain things you can say and cannot say, and all these, all these questions that regulate what people may or may not think about uh, the world. And that is something different than just ideas. It is linked to ideas but it is not exactly the same. And when it comes to how these discourses or these orders of knowledge come into place, it is not um, that there, there is someone who says, OK, this is what we think, right? This is not how it works. It is, it is and I will use that term quite regularly, it's the work of discourse communities. Right? So there are scholars, for instance, and if you're anthropologist, uh, Clifford Gertz uh, wrote about that already. I mean, these people that we describe read our books, right? And, and we respond to them. We are authors for a certain audience and not only for our colleagues in, uh, in, 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 the, in the lecture hall somewhere or on conferences. So no, these books are out there. They produce certain understandings and knowledge, if we uh, uh, call it like that. And we respond to what people do in the field. And this is not only the scholarly um, context, but also there are politicians, there are, there are journalists, there are lawyers, there are all kinds of people who respond to that. And together in a society or in the group, these discursive patterns emerge. And that's, that's what I try to um, il illustrate also, um, uh, or to, yeah, to, to bring across in, in uh, my an analysis of animism. Um, and I leave it like that. I will come back to some of these terms, uh, maybe when we, when we apply them. But um, that is basically what, what we need to, to follow my argument, I guess. So let me just uh, jump right into the um, debate of the early context of um, animism studies. And animism itself, um, anima, Latin, you may all know that. It's, uh, it's a word for the soul, but also for breath, for breathing, for life itself, right? And that is very similar to 
to um, the understanding in, uh, in Greek, it's uh, psyche yeah, or psyche, uh, but it's also uh, in Germanic languages, this, the, the soul yeah, the, uh, the, in, in, in German, um, and that, that's a common origin also of soul, um, Seele in German, um, and in other languages it's similar. It's linked to water, the See, right, uh, the, the lake, and the, in, in pre-Christian, um, understanding the, the, the souls of the deceased and also of the unborn were living in the, in the lakes. So there, there's a link between water in that sense and breathe, which breath and which both associated with, with uh, life. So that's, that, that, that links from the beginning and that you can go on into uh, in, uh, um, Indo-European languages as well, into Sanskrit, Om, yeah, the syllabus is the same origin, like uh, anima. So there's a very, very old common uh, denominator of linking life and soul and breathe and something into one discursive knot, if, if you want. So it's an, it's an old thing, but the term animism is pretty new. And it uh, was basically coined by Edward Burnett Tyler um, in his book, Primitive Culture, which was published 1871. And um, it was a, a, a time, and I will, I will say more about that because I, I want to embed this, this understanding into a larger intellectual context um, of the time. Um, but he uh, basically, um, defined animism in uh, this book, uh, first uh, published in 1871, as a belief in the animation of nature and the existence of spirits. Tyler was concerned with the question of the historical development of the concept of the soul. And he was very close to the evolutionary view of cultural development, which was very prominent in the 19th century. And Against this background, Tyler assumed that precursors of what would later become religion were created in these primitive cultures, which we would not use the term anymore, obviously, but it also he meant more like simple cultures, than, which is still derogatory. But I mean, that in, in these earlier stages, um, that, that um, that precursors um, were created in, in these cultures from dreams and hallucinations from which these cultures derived the conviction that there was something like a soul which constituted a person's alter ego. So there was an, an, an alter ego to the person. The second ego can leave the body during sleep, during illness, or under certain conditions. With the death of the body, um, this entity leaves the person and lives on as an independent soul spirit. Animals and plants also have a soul in this concept, as they also live and die. But even certain objects that appear in dreams, such as stones, weapons, or clothes, are animated according to this understanding. There has never been a clear evidence, archaeological evidence for such an interpretation. There are, there are hunches and indications, uh, but also large differences. But all this did not prevent Tyler from associating the first level of religion with soul spirits. Subsequently, the soul spirits would become gods, and uh, still later, the idea of a single god emerged. So far, we are fully in this colonial um, imagination of non-European cultures that as lower, um, lower in the cultural development and so on. If they have religion at all, then they have precursors to religion, right? Um, another term that was very prominent at the time was magic. Um, that was also uh, linked to that. But um, one thing is important to um, understand, Tyler, um, on the one hand, there, there is a clear, clear um, colonial setting uh, in this construction that is easy to, uh, to identify. But it was not Tyler's main intention to suggest a hierarchy or an evaluation on the basis of such a reconstruction. Um, Tyler's interest, and he was not alone, as I will um, say uh, a little bit uh, later, 
uh, in more detail. He was not alone in that. Tyler was, Tyler's concept of animism was intended to show the simultaneous existence of archaic, simple, primitive, um, and developed forms of religion in modern society. And he took a keen interest in what's going on in England and in, in the Alps, uh, where, where farmers uh, use amulets to, uh, to heal their, their uh, cows, for instance. Yeah, there were all kinds of magical rituals uh, in, that, in that context. Um, he went to seances to understand what these, what these um, psychists uh, and spiritualists do actually to experience other uh, irrational um, uh, reality and so on. So he, he and, and he participated in these seances even. So he had a, he had a very, very keen interest in uh, what's going on there actually. And that's what, what he called then also the, 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 the remains somehow uh, of, this, of this old stage of, um, of, of religious development. So, therefore, uh, Jason Joseph Storm, in his book, uh, The Myth of Disenchantment, um, aptly um, describes E.B. Tyler as the haunted anthropologist. Right? So they, they, they were, on the one hand, um, the, the superior, and enlightened, uh, rational observer, but at the same time, his, his contemporaries were not like that. Uh, there were so many people who were engaged in, in these uh, psychic or spiritualist uh, non-rational thing that apparently were not on their way to modernity, right? And we, that, that is part of uh, my argument here that, that at the time, that uh, 1870, but basically till, uh, till, uh, till the interbellum period, it was not clear where, where, we, where would we be going uh, with this European project of modernity. It was also a narrative of, it was on the one hand a narrative of success, of enlightenment, rationality, and, uh, and progress, but it was also a narrative of uh, loss. Uh, you lose also something with this. And it was not clear, and that, that, that is the, that is the um, context, I think, in which we need to put um, animism as well. And there's one term for that, um, occultism. And occultism today is a little bit dirty word, yeah? so you don't want to be an occultist. I mean, some people do, but most people would not find that a little bit icky. Yeah? But, but um, 120 years ago, it was very different. And that is exactly the period in which uh, uh, Tyler came up with, uh, with this, um, with this um, idea. And that's why I put in this little graph, I put graphic, I put occultism in the center. And occultism is very simple. Basically, it comes from occultus, which is a Latin word for hidden. Everything that is hidden can be occult, right? Uh, it's not secret. That's a different thing. Right? Um, uh, and, and occult, it, it's about an interest in the occult powers of nature, but also the occult powers of um, our psyche of our soul, uh, that we can materialize something, like in the seance, right? That there is a mind-body dualism that is broken down by certain pra practices or philosophies or whatever. And that was something that, that was very much in the center of intellectual um, discourse at the end of the uh, 19th century. And that, that goes into um, science and philosophy, uh, where you have uh, all these new, um, new findings and new phenomena like electricity. It's very occult. You don't see it. It has a lot of power. Radioactivity, all these things. Uh, magnetism was older already, but that's also an example of that. There, there's is that mind-body, yeah? then, then, then the idea of ether. Yeah. Yeah, nobody has ever seen ether, but you need it, otherwise the light would fall down, right? You need, <laughs> according to Newton, right? So, so that, there, there must be something that carries light on it. But all these questions were very occult, if you think about it. And, and the mind-body problem was a major topic in, uh, in, in philosophy at the time, um, coming from the Romantics, and say a little bit more about that 
uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, but also then in uh, psychology, we, we are looking here at the early phase of the introduction of psychology as an academic discipline. All these, this, uh, these, these chairs were founded uh, basically in this period um, and, and until the, first, the, the early 20th century. And if you look at the, the, the first work of all these new psychologists working in their labs, they were experimenting with these psychics, uh, with these spiritualists, with these mediums. Yeah? They put their cables in their head and then they went into trance. And that was one of the major, major things they, they were researching. What can we do with our brain yeah? or with our soul? Is there a kind of power that we can materialize by thinking? Um, all, these, all these questions were very strong in the, uh, in, in, in the research at the time, it was by, all, by no means clear in which faculty you should put psychology. Right? You, you had the very radical um, experimentalists and, 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 and scientists like Sigmund Freud. This has to be in the medical, medical faculty because it's science. right? But there were many others that know this has to be in the uh, faculty of philosophy because it's a humanities. It's a hermeneutic. We understand, we interpret something that humans do. It was not clear. It was only after, after basically after the Second World War that European uh, university said, okay, we go the behavioristical, experimental way um, that we're ba basically a behavioral science, uh, larger than, more than a philosophy. Um, and that, that's the decision that most universities took, which, which led to the, to the extinction of the concept of the soul in, in psychology. If you today look into dictionary of psychology, you don't even find an entry on the soul. Yeah? The soul, the psychology has less, lost its soul somewhere on the way here. Yeah? But, but uh, 120 years ago, this was very different. Um, and, and I will talk more about Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche, is, uh, um, uh, in, in a minute, um, um, thought of himself as a psychologist. And why so, I will explain. But then religion and academia, the same thing. All these new disciplines emerged at the end of the 19th century, including our own, uh, the study of religion. All these chairs were put into, uh, into the universities there. But also all these other, hin, hin, uh, Indology, Anthropology, Sociology. I mean, these are, were all new disciplines that, that led to a pluralization of knowledge somehow about religion across different disciplines. And, um, and that was also kind of professionalization of knowledge in a different way than uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. So these, these discussions about um, the hidden powers of nature and the hidden layers of reality and all these questions that I um, uh, introduced were part of a um, large um, academic and also um, political and cultural debate at the time. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's the context um, of um, 1870 with, uh, with E.B. Tyler. At the same year, um, if we move from, from, the, uh, from the UK to uh, Germany, uh, we see another important book that is Friedrich Nietzsche's um, the birth of the tragedy from a tragedy from the spirit of music, Geburt der Tragödie aus dem Geiste der Musik, came out in the same year, and it might be a little bit arbitrary <laughs> that that I link those, and I will say more about uh, Nietzsche's understanding here, but um, I hope it will become clear that Nietzsche is a cornerstone of this discourse, and all these people. That, that we might encounter later um, have read this uh, and have responded to that some, in, in some uh, way. Um, so in, in 1871, Friedrich Nietzsche finished his work on the birth of uh, tragedy from the spirit of music. And in, in that work, Nietzsche picked up themes that had already been under discussion for some time in the 19, uh, early from the early 19th century on, basically. And they, they were focusing on the figure of Orpheus um, and linked 
and, and combined the figure of Orpheus with those of Apollo and Dionysus, so these Greek, Greek um, gods. And Nietzsche's thinking made Orpheus the principle of what he, principle of what he then called the Dionysian. Um, and thus rendering the Greek god the opposite pole to what Nietzsche called the Apollonian. And I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard about this uh, before. This polarity became one of his most important, and he was a historian, a psychologist too, but he was also a historian of Greek philosophy, obviously, so that was his habitat, if you want. Um, but this polarity for him became his most important tool for interpreting ancient culture and, in fact, every culture. Um, he laid the basis for this cultural theory in the birth of tragedy. Um, two years earlier already, in his treatise, uh, The Dionysian Worldview, he had introduced this opposition between Apollonian and Dionysian as a means to interpret Greek tragedy. For Nietzsche, Dionysus embodies unconquered nature. So we have this, this inclusion of religion and nature already in, in, in a discursive way, um, in an interesting way here. Um, nature framed as a wild, ecstatic cult. It's, it's not accidentally um, the, the god of wine, obviously. Yeah. Ecstatic cult that had come from Asia to Greece. And I quote a description of this group, of this religion by Nietzsche. Dionysian art is based on the play with intoxication or ecstasy, the German is Rausch, with rapture, Verzückung. Yeah. There are two powers in particular that trigger, that trigger the oblivious ecstasy, Rausch, of the naive natural person. That's a, yeah, the, the, the primitive person, right? Um, close to nature. The drive of spring and the narcotic drink. Their impacts are symbolized by the figure of Dionysus. In both states, the principium individuationis is broken. The subjective disappears entirely under the force of the general human. Indeed, the general human that breaks force. The festivals of Dionysus not only create a bond between humans, they also reconcile the humans with nature." End quote. The conscious transgression of boundaries is a central characteristic of Dionysian experience of the world. By giving up their individuality, the participants become part of the community. At the same time, they experience the mystical powers of nature. The close links between Dionysus and the themes of mystical community and nature become explicit when Nietzsche writes, I quote, in ever larger droves, the gospel of world harmony is rolling from place to place. Singing and dancing, the human being expresses himself as a member of a higher ideal community. He has forgotten how to walk and to speak. Moreover, he feels enchanted, and indeed he has become something else. Just as the animals talk and the earth gives milk and honey, something supernatural sounds from him. He feels like a god. What used to live only in his imagination, he now feels in himself." End quote. Nietzsche stressed that the Dionysian needed the Apollonian. That's a Greek rational counterbalance somehow. Um, but Dionysus became the Dionysian as a principle, and Apollo became the Ap Apollonian. Um, Rüdiger Safranski, in his study of uh, Nietzsche, points out, I quote, in the summer of 1870, with the transformation of the stylistic characteristics of art, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, into metaphysical powers of life, Friedrich Nietzsche made his, the decisive step in his intellectual biography. From then on, he held in his hand the key he thought he could use to understand the trade secrets of all cultures, their history and their futures. Like Arthur Schopenhauer and other romantics, Nietzsche found the essence of the world in music. And that came also to the fore in this dancing and singing what he, in, in the last quote. Um, music was a link to ultimate primordial reality, which he tried to conceptualize as the Dionysian. 
while in antiquity the Apollonian refinement of the wild rage and sublimation of the animal drive and the human being was the task of the tragedy, in his own epoch, uh, Nietzsche found a similar task realized in the musical dramas of Richard Wagner. Uh, Wagner's projects offered a true experience of art and an antidote to the increasing intellectualism and commercialization of music in the 19th century. For Nietzsche, of course, this experience of music must not mix, be mixed up with a simple pleasure of listening. Um, it means listening to the, how he calls it, the ventricle of the world's will. Such music does not aim at superficial beauty, but at making contact with the horrible, in German, das Ungeheure, and the deep. He wrote to his close friend Erwin Rode, who um, was a, another classicist uh, of the time, in uh, 1868, after having listened to the overture to Wagner's Meistersinger, every fiber, every nerve twitched. I haven't had such a long-lasting feeling of rupture, entrücktheit, for a long time. So these are the terms, entrückung, ekstase, rausch, in this, in this discourse, in, Ger in the German version. Um, these are the terms which, not only for Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, but then also for uh, Erwin Rode, who wrote a two volumes book, come out in uh, 1900 on psyche, psyche, about the idea of uh, immortality among the Greeks. Um, that was part of this um, toolbox, if you want, to understand religion and uh, the, the real um, at, the, at the same time. Shortly after his, this experience with the Meistersinger, um, Nietzsche got in touch with um, Wagner and began to present the letters music until the end of their friendship in 1878 as a quintessential example of the Dionysian initiation. In The Birth of Tragedy, he writes, the tragedy sucks the highest orgiastic feeling of music into itself. That's the, he has very bombastic language. In contrast to those who stick to the surface of music and stylize that experience as the pleasure of art, Nietzsche addresses those who, like him, have music as their native language. And uh, there's another quote. To those real musicians, I pose the question of whether they can imagine someone who would be able to perceive the third act of Tristan and Isolde without the aid of any text or image, simply as an incredible symphonic movement and who would not breathe out their life in a compulsive spreading of all the wings of their souls. Right? Someone who put their ear to the ventricle of the world's will, who felt the raging desire for being as a roaring river or as a most sublime creek pouring into all the veins of the world, and who would not immediately break. Someone who could endure hearing in the miserable glass shell of the human individual the echo of countless cries of lust and pain from the wide space of the world's night, and who would not such, at such a shepherd's round dance of metaphysics flee inescapably to their original home. That was lag, which we are talking about here, right? It's a very... It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the red string, uh, that, that red, uh, the red thread that, that links romanticism to early 20th century German literature, such as Thomas Mann's Tod in Venedig or Hermann Hesse's Das Glasperlenspiel. Nietzsche's discursive uh, web of soul, music, transgression, ecstasy, metaphysics also includes nature, as we have seen. And uh, Jürgen Habermas points out, Art opens, I quote, art opens the way to the Dionysian only at the price of ecstasy, at the price of painful de-differentiation, of overcoming the individual's limits, of melting with an amorphous nature, both inside and outside. So that is, that is, uh, that is uh, the, the context here. And I would like to mention one last piece of evidence um, namely Nietzsche's comments on the music of the German masters. In his fourth untimely meditation, Nietzsche notes that this music 
quote, is a return to nature. And at the same time, it is the purification and transformation of nature. Because in the soul of the most loving human beings, the necessity for such a return emerged and nature transformed into the sounds of love in their art. End quote. For Nietzsche, nature comes to its teleological culmination in human consciousness. Even if that consciousness remains broken due to the impossibility of its actually incorporating the horrible. And this, as I said, construction or conception had enormous impact uh, in the 20th century. And Zafranz here, to quote him once more, concludes Nietzsche's Dionysus, Heidegger's being, and Adorno Horkheimer's nature are different names for the same thing for the horrible, das Ungeheure. End quote. At the same time, the horrible had immense potential to gauge the absolute being and to contact the ultimate ground of reality, a potential that certainly maintained its fascinating appeal throughout the 20th century. There's a new study but, uh, by um, Adam uh, Leschner who describes this appeal in the works of intellectuals such uh, as diverse as uh, Jane Allen Harrison, D.H. Lawrence, Martin Heidegger, Richard Schechner, and uh, Wolle Soinenka. As Lechard puts, out, um, puts it, in Nietzsche's beginning was his end, and in his end is our beginning. While Nietzsche danced with Dionysus in Turin, he initiated a series of associations, manipulations, reincarnations, and receptions that would make the Greek god into a symbol of vital modernity. End quote. Indeed, all of these intellectuals and many more that may come our way uh, when we look at animism contribute to the emergence of an order of knowledge with an impact that can still be seen today. <clears throat> what we can conclude and uh, apologize for this long uh, excursion on uh, Nietzsche, but um, as I said, um, many of these other people that we, that we come across uh, actually read this and were, were um, fascinated by, by that, including Mircea Iliade, who wrote many books about these, um, but also uh, many others in the study of religion. What we con can conclude from the analysis of occultism and Nietzsche's impact is that around 1900, um, European intellectual debates were torn between a clear rejection of everything um, that seemed irrational, metaphysical, um, or pre-modern, and a strong fascination with exactly these elements uh, of human culture that promised a new contact with the ultimate true and the ultimate sacred. And animism is a concept that illustrates this dynamic. In the course of the 20th uh, century, animism was particularly debated in the fields of anthropology and the study of um, religion. And I'd like to have a quick look at the reception, and then we have uh, time for a discussion. Um, uh, reception of E.B. Tyler's ideas about animism during the first half of uh, the 20th century. This also gives me uh, the opportunity, a welcome opportunity, to include the scholar whose name is commemorated in these lectures. As you all know, uh, Eva Paulson, who was um, very much into um, Tyler, Tylerian um, understanding of, um, of animism and the soul, and he was actually one of the leading experts at the time in anthropology about concepts of the soul in the non-European um, or in the pre-Christian European <laughs> understanding of, um, of uh, the cosmos. And yeah, you have his uh, dates there. He was born in Tallinn, as many of you, of course, know, in 1922, and uh, went to school there. And he studied at this university here, ethnography, archaeology, and history. And from 1942 onward, um, he, he studied here. 
And then in 1946, he did his first PhD in uh, ethnology at the University of Hamburg. Um, and then he emigrated to Sweden and studied with uh, Professor Arpmann in Stockholm. And there he received his uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Ethnology, History and Psychology of Religion in 1958. I, took a photo of all the books I checked out in the Groning Library. They, they are all there, right? So these are, these are important uh, books um, for the study of religion at the time. And uh, this actually is his Stockholm Dissertation, uh, as it's mentioned on the book. Um, the, the primitive Seelenvorstellungen der nordeurasischen Völker. The primitive, you have the same use of primitive here as in Tyler. Um, concepts of the soul in the North Eurasian uh, peoples. This is a um, clear indication of his uh, re research field, which he carried on after the PhD. Um, later, he extended his interest from concepts of the human soul to the animal soul and the role of wild an animals in the religions of various Eurasian groups in particular. So this was one of the uh, before he, his untimely death in uh, 1966, another big um, volume on um, uh, guardian spirits and game divinities of hunting animals and fish in northern Eurasia, very specified. And there is an, if you look at his um, uh, work, and for me it was nice uh, to revisit it because I had read it for my study on shamanism many years ago. Um, but um, there's an interesting tension uh, in Paulson's work that on the one hand, there's a clear, this colonial gaze um, that was very prominent at the time still in the, uh, in, in the middle of the uh, 20th century um, on primitive cultures and their cosmologies. And this matches Tyler's understanding of an animism in primitive culture. And he also quotes Tyler um, in his work and takes it basically for granted that this is, this is what we call animism. Uh, but Paulson was also very, very nuanced in, uh, when it comes to describing the Northern Eurasian concepts of the soul. Um, he, for instance, talked about uh, and identified the, a certain dualism um, of the soul in these cosmologies, dist distinguishing a body soul, körperseele, from a life soul, and so on. He also didn't work much with the term animism, probably took it for granted, but it's, it does not figure prominently. Um, and he also differentiated um, between animism uh, and animatism in his work. Animism coming from anima, um, uh, meaning that the, the, the idea of the soul in uh, non-human entities and animatism as uh, the idea of an animated non-human uh, nature. And this is not the same as he argued. So, so you can see how, how differentiated the discourse actually was in anthropology uh, at this time, certainly in centers like uh, like uh, where he contributed to, and particularly then also in his Stockholm period. Um, in the last phase of uh, writing, he returned to the spiritual and religious traditions of his own Estonian heritage. And his last book was translated from an unfinished draft into English. That is this one, the old Estonian folk uh, religion, 1971. And that book is mainly based on previous anthropological literature and presents that in a concise way to a wide, wider audience. And it will be interesting talking about discourse communities, and I will talk more about that tomorrow when, when we look at like shamanism, neo-paganism, all these new spiritualities that also absorb um, scholarly literature to some extent and, and adopts narratives that come from scholarly um, uh, discourse um, and put that into practice. I'm not, a, not an as, uh, expert on uh, old Estonian folk religion, but I'm sure people are, the, the experts are in this room. Um, and I'd, I'd uh, like to also uh, learn more about if something that I see happening in the 
uh, Euro, uh, Western European and North American case also happens. That would be my hypothesis. <laughs> also happens in, um, in the Baltic region and in the Estonian folk religion context. The re-spiritualization of something and the reclaiming of animism as a term that is positively uh, connotated. Um, and while in, in the 1950s uh, this, this term was still um, used in <clears throat> academic uh, parlance, uh, this changed uh, pretty quickly with uh, the advent of post-colonial critique. Um, that was not a new, uh, unanimous uh, critique. Um, and to begin with, we, we should also not forget that uh, their, um, uh, the, the, the negative stereotype of animism um, never went uh, unchallenged. And already in the 1960s and 70s, anthropologists developed a uh, neo-Tylorian approach to animism that tried to disconnect the concept from its colonial entanglements. One a representation um, of this scholarly approach is in social anthropology is Robin Horton. In 1968, he engaged the question of why neo-Tylorian has become such a pejorative term in social anthropology. And it's nice to quote him. The short answer seems to be that when someone in pre-literate society answers questions about the cause of an event by making a statement concerning the activities of invisible personal beings, the neo-Tylorian, following his ancestor, Sir E.B. Tyler, takes the statement at its face value. He accepts it as an attempt at explanation and goes on to ask why members of the culture in question should try to explain things in this unfamiliar way. To the layman, this approach is likely to seem self-evidently sensible. To the orthodox social anthropologist, however, it is misguided in the extreme." End quote. Despite these attempts to save Tyler's concept, assessments of animism as a preliminary stage of um, of religion, similar to considerations on magic, led to a problematic constellation in the academic study of religion and in anthropology, which made use of academic categories in their colonial move to underpin the leading place of monotheism as well as European rationality and science. This move was, was repeatedly uh, criticized of the course of many academic debates uh, that I don't have to go into here, um, so that the concept of animism was disavowed, basically, in the academic study of religion. And consequently, in 1995, this is all we read about animism in the HarperCollins Dictionary of Religion, edited by J.C. Smith. That's the whole entry, right? Um, animism. Uh, Latin anima, soul, an obsolete term employed to describe belief systems of traditional peoples that appear to hold that natural phenomena have spirits or souls. Introduced in 1871 by the British anthropologist E.B. Tyler, it should be used with caution as a cross-cultural term of comparison or as designating a stage in the evolution of religion. That's it. In some cases, scholars even expressed disdain uh, about those people who still use the term animism. That's a quote, I don't have it on a slide, but it's from the Brill Dictionary of Religion, uh, Gerhard Schlatter, who says, to be sure, the concept repeatedly resurfaces in popular scientific contexts, as well as in scholarly milieus that do not take into account advances in the study of religion. So the, the people haven't heard the news. It is uh, put forward as a name for tribal religions or magical belief in spirits among nature peoples. Nor has animism been expelled from an uh, in part trivial connection in the art world or from writings inspired by missionary theory and practice. That was in 2005, this dictionary. 
it is funny that uh, Schlatter mentions the art world and some trivial New Age spiritualities that apparently haven't yet gotten the message. It is funny because uh, the re-evaluation and even reclaiming of animism as a scholarly tool of interpretation was strongly inspired by spiritual practices in Europe and North America. And this is exactly what I will uh, turn to in the lecture tomorrow. But I'd like to stop here and open the floor for any questions and comments. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Questions are certainly most welcome. Who wants to be the eager first person? Concerning um, Edward Tyler, um, you were mentioning, if I'm not putting words in your mouth, that he was positing these uh, different cultures as irrational through their belief system. But when I read him, I felt he was actually trying to make them very pragmatic, how the soul is not some kind of abstract concept that you could find like in Gnostic texts, but instead they have shape, they move around, they have localization, they have all these kind of very concrete element, and then there's just a basic assumption that they exist. Mm -hmm. And so I would like just uh, yeah. clarity on this. Aspect. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that correction. No, I, that's absolutely true. Yeah, no, he, he was not. Um, he was much more nuanced also than, than I uh, wiped over, <laughs> over over this. I mean, it's a two, it, it's a big big book that he uh, that he published, and there are many examples of this, and and it is so influential also because he assembled so much information from all over the world, and there's certainly a basis to this to this understanding, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, until <laughs> you have more questions. <laughs> Go ahead. I, um, um, oh, sorry, no, I almost forgot. Um, it was in connection with theosophy and abstraction and spiritualism and mm -hmm. occultism. And um, oh, but now I forgot the question I wanted to ask. Um, the point I was trying to make was... Um, it seems to me that there was a bit like two teams in this kind of quest about the soul. And there are people who are much more trying to explain it pragmatically and others who are much more, well, actually three, <laughs> I would say they are more pragmatic than you would have more spiritualist, but uh, still uh, in their mindset, the soul is something very concrete. And then spiritualists, but who make it very abstract, like the theosophists and um, yeah, I was just um, wondering this, this kind of uh, point. Uh, oh, no, I forgot. Yeah, it's sad. I, I forgot mm -hmm. the question I had. But uh, I did these elements. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit sad. Um, yeah, well, well, do you have any... Um, do you think that uh, these kinds of... Uh, studies, as different ways of studying, so the kind of pragmatic and more spiritual, have continued through or has one died out over mm -hmm. the time? Or is it mm -hmm. still both the case? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it depends a little bit on how you, how you approach it. In a discursive understanding, these discourses certainly have been carried on. And uh, I will talk about that more. When, when it comes to concrete uh, ideas and, um, and, and, and interpretations and maybe also groups and so on, then it depends a little bit on where you're looking at. If you, if you mention the, uh, the, the Theosophical Society, for instance, you clearly see the continuation of that also in uh, Anthroposophy, in the Steiner's version of, of it, uh, who talks a lot about the soul and about the uh, more the spiritual understanding, the, the higher consciousness, and all these terms that um, um, th that are part of that. But particularly also for the for the um, theosophical context, it is not only true for the for the spiritual interpretation, but I think also for the.
for the picking up of, um, of academic discourse um, of the time and then turning that into historical narratives about religion or religious studies and so on, or also natural science um, and so on. And, and um, there, there are definitely continuities, uh, continuities there. So there was a question somewhere. Oh. Um, thank you. Uh, do you think it is justified to consider the term animism uh, outdated? Um, if yes, why? And do you think uh, the term the animatism... The microphone doesn't seem to work. Oh, 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 the microphone is only for the recording. But I, I don't think that the others in the back hear you, right? Is that? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I tried to yeah. speak, uh, yeah. speak up. Uh, so do, do you... I think it is justified to consider the term animism outdated. Uh, if yes, why? And do you think the term animatism should also be considered outdated? I think so, yeah, yeah. If, 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 you, if you let go of the, the first, then the, you also let go of the other, I think. But yeah. do you think there are no such phenomena that they kind of um, were supposed to uh, uh, to designate? Mm -hmm. No, uh, that's not what I would uh, argue. It, it, it's more about the term, and that's also many, many critics of, um, of um, uh, Tyler and the concept, not only Tyler, but the concept would say, of course, there are phenomena that uh, people explain certain things in a certain way and also have certain cosmologies that differ, like Robin Horton, like the quote I, I had from Robin Horton. These, these people are, are there, and we have to um, deal with, with their ideas in some sense. And um, I, I will come back to that also in the last uh, lecture, um, because the, the whole understanding of the, the, the new understanding of animism that you, that you see in the study of religion and anthropology over the last 20 years, it's not the, an ontological interpretation of animism as some kind of there are spirits, or they're, 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 they are ensouled or alive, or something. That's an ontological statement, but as a relational thing. And I, I will come back to that. That's, uh, but but there, there are other ways of using the term animism, in a sense, to apply um, better to the phenomena. But there are still people like David Chittis who say, OK, you cannot save the term. It is so, and, and he works in South, South Africa, and, and he's confronted, he's very much part of the kind of colonial um, reification of these discourses. He say, okay, we, can, we, should, we should let go of the term, even if it's positively connotated in some context, we should find different terms for describing what's going on there. So that would be my short answer to that. So what is a word to, which would be more politically correct to use instead of animism and animatism? There are all kinds of, um, again, I don't want to give you all my answers already from the last. OK, so I we get these answers later? Them. Yeah, I, I okay. will discuss some of them. But you can, you can uh, call it a certain cosmology or epistemology or ontology or whatever. So you, you can say a relational ontology. Well, for instance, and, uh, or a certain epistemology that you talk with persons who are not humans. Uh, some, so there, 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 are, there are candidates that are discussed in, in uh, cultural studies and anthropology. Absolutely. I don't know what actually, for me, it depends on the context. If I deal with uh, people who call them what they do, uh, like neo shamans, for instance, uh, in in uh, Scandinavia, also what, what what they call animism, I have no problem in saying, okay, if you if you call this animism, it's it's yours to define it, and I'm happy to use it. But it's not an analytical tool for me, right? That's different. It's more the language that people use, and I put it into a discourse on animism, but it's not an analytical tool that I use to apply it to other, other contexts, for instance. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, there was something I wanted to ask, actually. It kind of relates to the previous question. So when one uh, 
sort of uh, brings up the topic of the animism and the sort of the discussion. It's it's kind of an assumption maybe in study of religion that then we get the whole history of animism, animatism, mana, and so on. But um, you do get different path, and also. Um, Maybe you can sort of comment on this. But, uh, mm. and, and secondly, also that isn't, wasn't, in my impression is that there was also this, not just the post-colonial sort of uh, or the rejection of it, but there was before that in 20s and 30s kind of a, well, I don't know, social evolutionist rejection who were exactly using the whole moret and everything to say that, no, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the stage in religion. Actually, they were doing different things. So within sort of the social evolutionist scheme, there was a, a strong opposition to it already in 20s and 30s, even if they were not rejecting the whole larger scheme mm -hmm. of thought. Or what, what would you think of those two aspects? Yeah, no, I agree that there, there, there has been a critical debate about um, the usefulness of the, of the concept, or also the applicability of the concept, all these, all these concepts, and there, there are others that it was linked to the whole discussion of magic, which is another huge, huge um, concept. Also, the, 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 the link with rationality is magic. Irrational, no, it's rational. It's very rational, only it's a different form of rationality, and so on. Um, so, so there was a whole, whole debate going on about these concepts, and animism was part, part of that concept as well, not only in the, in the sense of are there these evolutionary stages that we can really uh, identify, which, is, which are quite hypothetical, and the more you know about the history of religion, the, the less it works. Uh, it all goes all, always, uh, all, the, all the time. It is not a clear, uh, clear progress uh, narrative there. Um, and yeah, no, so I, I, I fully agree that there were other ways of, um, other ways of uh, approaching the, the term. And uh, what, what I think, what, what the common denominator of, this, of these debates is both in terms of um, when it comes to magic, when it comes to irrationality and, uh, and, and science and religion, that, that's another topic that was very strong at the time, is that that there is an underlying um, concern. Let's call it that. The concern: What does it mean to be a modern European? And that, that's that's what I think um, is is a, a very strong element of this whole, and that 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 factors into that can be factored in the colonial thing, which is also not just a one one way uh, road, but it's an it's it's an encounter situation where you are encountering alternatives and you see something back in your own um, presence, not only in the in, in the past and so on. There there's a there's a work on what it does it mean to be modern and and enlightened in that whole concept. And we see it in in, in all these representatives. I mean you can also use Max Weber as an example who who had his uh, palm read, uh, um, for instance, to experience what's going on. And he was very clearly not a religious person, but he was interested in what, what happens to religion with this disenchantment, when, when the disenchantment is kicking in. What, what, and, and, and these are, these are um, very nuanced and also very troubled somehow um, attempts at interpreting what's going on. So, so that, that was, um, maybe it's a little bit too vague as, as an answer, but, but I think there, there, there are these connections that, that are very, very strong at the time. And uh, in, the, in the 1920s, uh, it, there was a high, high period for that. And, and after, after the war, many things changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone else have something they want to ask? We have... Time for one or two questions more. Okay, one more. Thanks. I I would like to argue a little bit uh, concerning animism because uh, um, animism is a faculty of uh, thinking about minds uh, without bodies, which is a distinctive human ability. <clears throat> so it is. Uh, very difficult to discard this kind of thinking. You can uh, put uh, for it uh, other names. For example, 
mentalism, like imagining beings, disembodied spirits. But um, <clears throat> it, it cannot be done away so simply. Mm -hmm. What do you think of it? Yeah, I mean, that, that resonates with the question that, that you had, uh, I think, a little bit. There, there are phenomena that, that we see and that we take for granted, like what you said, that we, we have the cap, uh, capacity to imagine uh, a, a person that doesn't have a body, something like that, like, like what you said. That's, that's, not, that's not the controversial thing, I think. Um, it, it is controversial to say, like, Okay, okay, we all know. I mean, the kids do this all the time, yeah? And you, you, you read Piaget and all these, it's still the, the official kind of child development, uh, how, how our brain works. And that, yeah, we, we, we imagine these animated uh, um, stuffed animals and, and all these, this is part of how our brain, but at some point we lose that. And it's, it's part of a mature um, uh, adult um, person to, um, to understand that these, these things are not rationally true, right? Or these are not rationally explainable. These are made up. Uh, we all know that my computer doesn't have a soul, right? Uh, and uh, so these, these normative statements, and that, that's where, that's where the, the thing derails somehow. And that's a critique. And uh, then, then you see, okay, oh, oh we have these, these, um, these cultures that, that take that for granted. So they must be a kind of, and that, this is a language that, that was still in anthropology like 100 years ago. These were like uh, the, the child phase of cultural development. They haven't really yet understood that the, the tree, that, that there is no spirit living in the tree. Yeah, I cut it down and nothing happens. Huh? So, so, so th this is the language we are talking. This is a very colonial and also very violent approach to this, to these phenomena, and and that is the critique. It is not, um, um, I would say, the the assumption that these things don't these things don't exist, and then it, it's turned around. Like if you re read uh, Bruno Latour, uh, we've never been modern. He said, I have a quote. Think tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, this is this is part of our self-fashioning, as if we don't have that, like what you describe, and and that's the problem. And then there are all, all these new um, spiritual movements. Say, okay, we reclaim that pro. We, we reclaim that uh, um, animistic understanding. And and what does that do to the equation of what happened to religion in the secular context? These are the interesting questions, I think. Yes, but uh, these people who lose this ability are very few, actually. They, they are very rational, because even in Western countries, we visit graveyards, for example, to, to see the graves of our relatives. Mm -hmm. So they uh, should be imagined somehow still uh, alive. So uh, I would uh, I agree I would with you, <laughs> and, and uh, I, I, I agree with you. But if, if you read the anthropologists, particularly of the first part of the 20th century, they would not agree with you. Okay. So, so that they, they, would, they would say, when people do this, then that is superstition, or that is, a, a, that is a wrong belief, because we know from science that these people are dead. And, and, and what they think, we, we can acknowledge that we still have this, these cultures, and we need, to, we, we need memory, we need all kinds of, it does, we, it, it, it helps to think that they're still alive, but of course, this is not scientifically proven. And therefore, we should not rely on that as, an, as a scientific, um, that, that is kind of folk culture. So that it, it is this, this rhetoric of, of um, um, putting that into a certain box of non-rational, not scientific, non uh, enlightened understanding. Although, I mean, all these scholars themselves know that it is very popular. That's uh, like, like what I said in, in the beginning, 60% of the millennials would totally agree with that. And still there is not scholarly literature that really looks into that in, in the sense that it would match the interest. 
we're still studying Christianity, although Christianity is much less in, uh, popular than astrology, for instance. But where are there all the scholars of astrology to study European culture today, for instance? So that, that's, that's what I mean, and that's, that's what I what I tackle a little bit with a discursive understanding. So these are orders of knowledge that we take for granted that astrology is shit, even if 30% of the, of the European population thinks it's more trustworthy than Christianity. We still don't see it worthy of studying, and we still study other things that, uh, even, even though they are not no longer really evidence, there's no evidence of popularity, which is not true for Christianity, that's not what I mean, <laughs> but yeah. Yes, I agree, I understand that you, you uh, regard anim animism as uh, nothing inferior to like uh, uh, major, in regard to a major religion or something like this. But mm -hmm. animism is also becoming more popular during these days, as there is a French professor who wrote, what was his name? Who wrote a thick book that was translated also into Estonian, like uh, yeah. animism. Uh, is uh, becoming more popular these yeah. days. Yeah, that's exactly the yeah, yeah, Descola. Descola, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Eduardo Cohn. There, there, there are many. And I will. That's exactly the topic uh, for tomorrow. Yeah. So that's 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 about. Okay, we, we we have all these new revivals of animism since the turn of the 21st century, basically. Yeah. And how can we explain that? Well, for the let's say last concluding question. Thank you. It was more like a quick comment on uh, the soul of your computer. Uh, I have a friend who is an IT guy, and he claims that uh, computers do have a soul, and when a computer dies, uh, the, its soul leaves uh, the body in a uh, form of puff of smoke. <laughs> okay. okay. I would fully agree with that. I mean, I, I always, also when, when, I, when I talk about animism in... in, in with, with, with students I, or with, with audience, I say, okay, who of you says goodbye uh, to your dog when you leave the house or to your cat? Everyone. You're an animist, right? Uh, and, uh, and who gives names to your bike, for instance, or to your computer? You're an animist. I mean, we all, I agree, we, we are all animists. And like Bruno Latour, the, the, the funny thing is not to, to, um, to say that, oh, there are still people who are animists, no, the, it's the other way around. It's, it's a very counterintuitive thing is that to assume that there are still people who think of a de-animated world. And, uh, but but this, this is part of the change, I think, that's um, that what, what I call the relational turn, um, that, that we take that more for granted, and this is more mainstreaming today than 50 years ago. Well, I think we will concludes for today maybe and uh, <laughs> then we can come back tomorrow at the same time and continue <laughs> with all the questions that remained unasked and um, uh, I hope to see you all here tomorrow too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.